Hi, Marcy. <laughs> Hi, Grace. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. So Marcy's got her own podcast, How to Ruin Your Reputation. Mm -hmm. How to Ruin Your Own Reputation. Yep. Reputation. And I saw her on 50 Tastes of Grey, and I was just so, uh, I just loved your pod the podcast and like the way you talk. And I was like, I got to talk to this lady. <laughs> Let's talk. So you talk a lot about, uh, we've gone through a lot with body image and um, your relationship to food, which is why I wanted you to have you on the podcast because, you know, uh, we talk about a lot of things with food on this podcast, but we don't really talk that much about um, like, body image and eating disorders. And I thought that was an interesting perspective because to me, that's got to be the hardest thing to overcome because it's not like you, everybody has to eat. So, (laughs) so I wanted to learn a little more about that and, um, you know, just kind of hear your story. Yeah. I mean, you're right. It's a, it's a tough thing because I mean, food is everywhere everywhere. And it's not like I'm not comparing disorders and addictions. So I want to make that clear. However, I'm just saying that with other things, you can abstain in order to get past them. You can abstain from alcohol. You can abstain from gambling, you can abstain from drugs, but with food, no, you can't, nobody's going to say don't eat. And also be, nobody would say to a heroin addict, okay, so just have a reasonable amount of heroin three times a day, like you just can't. So we have to face this all the time. Plus our society is so wrapped up in it. Also where we use food for everything. So it's it's a happy celebration, we're bringing food. It's a sad occasion, we're bringing food. It's every holiday, I mean, every single month has some kind of food attached to it, whether it's, it's Easter or Christmas or Valentine's. There's always some sort of, it's just, you can't escape it, whether you're, your disorder is that you deprive yourself of it or whether you binge on it. Um, there, I mean, there's, I kind of ran the gamut of all of it, but it's, and it's everywhere too, in the sense that it's not just, okay, I'm going to avoid going into restaurants. It's, or grocery stores. You go to the library and there's cafes, you go to the pharmacy, there's food, you go to the gas station. There's, I mean, it's, (laughs) you're facing your kind of enemy because that's how it feels. It's not, but that's how it feels all the time. And it's really, it's really tough. Plus there's so much judgment around it. So even trying to get better. So even when, uh, let's say at the time when I was, and I'll go back and sort of explain, but, but there were times when I was too thin and I was under eating um, or over exercising. Then there were times when I was overeating and under exercising and, the, the the crazy thing is eating disorders are the only disorder that society cheers on. So you lose weight, even when in my head, I knew not even in my head, it was doctors or my family or my friends saying, okay, you need to eat to be healthy. Society was saying, no, you need to not eat to be attractive. So I would have, logically, I knew I had to eat to be healthier, but then somebody would go, oh, you lost so much weight. You look great. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to gain weight then. I mean, we see it with people. I've had so many people say to me, oh my God, I was so sick with the flu. And someone's like, oh my God, you lost weight. What's your secret? And it's like, no, (laughs) that's not okay. Or the the feeling of, I remember when I was in recovery and going to a Dairy Queen with my kids and being so excited. They were so excited to see me just get a blizzard, you know, to get something. And there was a woman next to me and she was getting what I used to get, which is they had these fat-free but the one fat free thing they had fudgicles, you know, and I'm like, Oh God, like I should be, she's getting, and maybe, you know, and it's, it's just, it's such a, it's so we demonize food so much. Although again, look at a lot of old school magazines for women and it, you know, one page it's how to make the world's best cookies. And then the other page is how to not eat the cookies, you know, how to lose weight from eating the cookies or everything you do during the holidays. The holidays are the worst because you'll have, all of this, these recipes for eating with your family, doesn't matter what holiday it is, all these recipes. And then immediately it's how to lose the holiday weight that you put. It's like, <laughs> let me enjoy it. Oh my God, we can't even enjoy it for two minutes. We have to repent 
you go to an exercise class during the holidays and it's like, now you can have a whatever, you know, we just worked off a cookie. And it's like, no, I just want to work out because it feels good. Not because I need to repent or earn my food. You don't need to earn your food because you worked out. You get to eat even if you didn't exercise today. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) It's, it's, It's a battle. It's a battle. It's funny what you said. Um, I So I'm a flight attendant, so there's definitely a lot of pressure to look good. <laughs> and uh, actually, I I was working with this, uh, one of my colleagues, she's like, she's definitely done modeling before. She's beautiful. But one of uh, the male flight attendants came to, up to her and was like, oh, wow, you lost weight. And her reaction was like, oh, no, I lost weight because she has trouble keeping weight on. And I just thought that was so interesting because I think whether or not she looked like she lost weight or not, he was going to say that because he was just trying to give her a compliment. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but the rule is yeah, never, ever, ever comment on someone else's body. It's just never yeah. necessary. Like, And I even feel that way if you know somebody who's trying to lose weight and maybe they felt health wise, they needed to lose weight. You can say, wow, you look happy. You look healthy. You look so energetic. Like there's ways to compliment that aren't weight. It's just, and you don't know. I mean, there were times when I looked the most, let's say fit to some people in the sense I was working with a trainer. He said he can get me to look like a, a fitness model. And he did. Um, and there are people that, oh my God, you're so fit. No, I was not fit. It's not how you look. It's what you do to get there. So the fact that I was starving, the fact that I was completely dehydrated, the fact that my body stopped working properly, the fact that I was totally overtraining and I wasn't sleeping. Why is that healthy? Because I look the way you think I should look. That's not healthy. So it's not about how you look. It's about what you're doing. People who carry a little bit more weight, but are active are healthier than people who are sedentary, but just happen to be born thin. It's, it's not, you really, unless we're talking extremes, because whenever I say this, someone's always like, so if you're 6,000 pounds, you're healthy. And it's like, oh, don't like, come on. Yeah. But so we're talking, unless you're talking extremes, you cannot tell how fit or healthy somebody is by how they look. You can't. You can't, it's, you're totally projecting. And our society is, is unbelievably fat phobic. It's been fat phobic forever. If you look back at ads from God, a million years ago, decades and decades and decades and decades ago, I I remember seeing black and white magazine and, you know, there'd be ads for um, like a cleaning product for women. And it would be like, clean the house while you lose weight. Like, it's like all, it, it was so crazy. But then there were also pills that will make you curvier. It's like the fashion industry was deciding what we should be. You know, if this season we're supposed to be skinny, then you better lose weight. But if you're supposed to have a big ass, well, then you better gain weight. But then, you know, it's just, you can't. Well, you can have a big ass, but you can't have a big stomach. That's not well, that's it. Because our bodies work that way. We get to pick <laughs> and choose. Exactly. That always, that's the tiny waist, flat stomach, big boobs, big butt. Like, yeah. okay, great. Like what, what how? So, but that's what people, they actually see that. And there are so many people who think that that's actually attainable. And that's what's such a shame too, is that instead of working with our bodies and figuring out where our bodies need to be, kind of letting our bodies tell us, because I think that like your best body is the body that you're in when you feel the best, when you can do the things that you want to do, the things that you need to do, that's where your body is supposed to be. And I think that uh, when you, when you do that, when you eat properly and by properly, I mean, not depriving yourself, but also not overdo. We know, we know some, and it's okay to sometimes overeat. And you just know that sometimes like it doesn't feel great when you overdo it. So we don't do it all the time. But when you just let your body do what it's supposed to do, it will tell you where it's supposed to be. Instead of what we do is we pick a number, either a weight or a size, and then we kill ourselves trying to fit into that. When it might be completely impossible to attain, or even if you can get there, it might be impossible to keep to keep that weight and then we feel like failures because i was able to lose all this weight and get into a size whatever but now i can't keep it i'm such a failure no it's just that your body doesn't want to be there and that's the problem so we definitely got ahead of ourselves 
<laughs> so where uh, where did you start kind of saying, hey, I got a problem with this this eating food stuff and not eating food stuff? <laughs> well, for me, it started when I was 17 and I was always um, very athletic and I was I danced and never had an issue with my weight at all. Never even thought about it. It was really comfortable with myself. And I loved food. My mother used to always call me her best eater out of my, my, the three of us, there were three siblings and I was the best eater. I would try anything and I had the biggest appetite. And then it was, um, I think 16, I started to kind of like question a little bit just because of that's the age and I had my sister's cosmopolitan magazine. I would always look at that and compare myself to the mom. What kind of food did you uh did your mother cook did, are you uh well I, my mother wasn't the best cook which is why I'm not the best cook but it was just everything like I was very big on Italian food and I was big I like bread and I was always a big chocolate person always been always still I am always will be. The best food that's why it's the best <laughs> I always say my last meal if I had to pick my last meal it would definitely be like fresh baked chocolate chip cookies um but I liked everything I really did and and there was no I didn't have any issues in my house. My mother didn't have issues. My, like there was no pressure on any of that. Like it just wasn't a thing. Um, and then I started, you know, kind of thinking, should I diet? And my mother would say, no, don't be silly. And I, and I would go to my brother a lot, who was five years older, who I adored because my father was, had been out of the picture for several years. And I'd say, oh, should I lose weight? And he'd say, no, you're perfect. Like I say, oh, I have friends going to Weight Watchers. He's like, they never accept you. Like you're, you're great. Like don't. So I listened. And then when I was 17, my brother got sick and it, it was a big shock to me when he died. I was, I had just turned 17. And that to me, I didn't completely make the connection right away, but I noticed when he went into the hospital, I joined White Watchers. And I even remember going up to him and saying, like whispering in his ear, I joined White Watchers and he shook his head like, you're crazy. Like, you know. Um, but I think what had happened was, well, I know now what had happened was when he died and I really, really started just obsessing over food and calories and weight, it was my way of trying to gain control in a life that suddenly seemed completely out of control. So my life made sense up until that point. And then when my brother, who had always been, I mean, he was 21 years old, he'd always been very athletic, great guy. I thought, oh my God, if he could get sick and die. There's no protection in the world. Like anything bad can happen. So that was the first thing. So what, what's the one thing I can control is my body. That's the only thing I can control. The other part of it was that I felt that he was a better person than I was. I felt that he was just much more needed in the world than me. And if I was going to be here instead of him, then I had to earn my place. And I, I, I didn't feel worthy of it. And I thought, well, I'm not super smart. I'm not super interesting. I'll try to be pretty. And to my 17 year old brain, that meant skinny. And so that became my mission. And it, again, it also gave me something else to focus on. So I would say it was easier to focus on my empty stomach than his empty room. And so did it, it that, uh, Weight Watchers, did that also become more like your community then? No, I don't remember even going there very long. I think what I did was I, I remember getting like, I don't think I, yeah, I think I went a couple of times. I took their book. And I would just follow the guidelines, but not even. I'd be like, well, if you're supposed to have this, then if I cut it in thirds, <laughs> then it's even. And then it was just like, yeah. So I kind of did my own thing. But what happened, this is the craziest part. This is the craziest part. So here I am, 17, barely 17, biggest tragedy of my life up until that point. My big brother dies. And we're super, super close. And I saw myself, as I said, getting very obsessed with my weight. And then I went away to camp like two months later one month later it was a camp I was teaching dance he was supposed to be there he had been there the summer before we were supposed to be there together but his friends were there and they encouraged me to go and I went and I was teaching dance all summer so again I never had a weight issue hmm? what kind of dance was it oh it was like you know hip hoppy kind of stuff um but uh, I so I, I I went there and was teaching dance never had a weight issue um, always fit. And I had a good summer. It was a good summer. And I thought, okay, you know what? I, I'm okay. I was eating normally. I thought, okay, I've got, and I was 
aware enough, which is crazy. We're talking in the eighties, you know, at 17 years old to know, okay, you're not, you weren't taking care of yourself. Like you got to stop this. So, which was great <laughs> until I get back from camp. And now it's only been what, four months since, since my brother died, maybe. And I go for a physical for, um, yeah, my mother was very adamant about, obviously about my health. And I go for a physical and my family doctor who knew my brother, who knew the situation, um, told me to get on the scale. And I said to him, you know, I'd seen myself get really obsessed with my weight and please don't tell me how, like, don't tell me the number, because I think if I hear a number, it'll mess me up. So I, I don't want him. And he said, well, don't be ridiculous. Like you need to get on the scale. So I got on the scale and then he started to berate me and to yell at me because he said that even though medically speaking, I wasn't overweight, society was very thin. And if I wanted to fit into society, I had to lose 10 pounds. And then he started to point to my stomach saying, what is that? Look at that. What is that? And he'd say, you go in a bathing suit like that. I wouldn't go in a bathing suit until I lost 10 pounds. Now, I had never in my life had anybody comment on my weight. Again, it's, it was not, I was fit. I was healthy. And uh, he even admitted not overweight. What do they, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> hold on. <laughs> First, I'm like, well, what the fuck did he look like? <laughs> but it's always the fat, overweight man. It's just an average thing. dude who, yeah, some fucking scumbag. Look, it took it took some therapy to realize that this was obviously uh, incredibly negligent. I had friends who saw him after I did. He he didn't say anything. Who were heavier than me. He was trying to mold me into what I think what he wanted. Yeah, me to look like what a fucking creep. But also, did they just not? In the 80s, like, did they understand eating disorders yet, even, or? Um, probably not, because some doctors still didn't understand it. But I think he was just, he did a lot of bad things. He was, he was just, he had, didn't have, after that, a great reputation. So I think I just got really unlucky with this human being. But I left there thinking, I'm not going to let this, I'm not going to let this upset me. I'm not going to let this upset me. And then I was actually the crazy, another crazy part of it was that because my brother had died of a liver disease that was hereditary, although there were no symptoms, we didn't know until it was too late. But then when he died and, and we knew what it was, my sister and I had to be tested for it. And, and my liver was kind of off. And so I had to be tested like every week for a while. And so I was going straight from that appointment to the hospital to be, to get blood tests and to talk to the doctor. So it was an emotional thing. And I remember going there with my mom and sitting at the cafeteria and I remember ordering toast with nothing on it. Like normally I'd get butter or I get, and it was, that was when I thought it's, it's done. Like that switch, like I had, I had, when I got back from camp that summer, it really could have gone either way. Cause my head was like, all right, I'm going to be okay. And then he, it was that little push over the edge. And I will tell you that I lost those 10 pounds and then another 10 and then another 10 until I was down 30 from not having to lose any. And I remember, oh, he also would have me every week come in and bring him a, the, a, a list of everything I had eaten. And if he didn't like it, then he would yell at me for eating something that he felt I shouldn't eat. Um, I mean, obviously now, knowing what I do now, it would have been very different, but I, I, I didn't. And my mother knew and she hated it, but she was also feeling like, cause I remember she felt so much guilt after. But she felt like, okay, you were 17. I didn't want to jump in because maybe you'd be mad at me that I jumped in and you want to, you know, but she didn't, she didn't know what to do. Um, also, but I, uh, he trusts this, you know, this medical professional that's supposed to know what he's doing and he's fucking. But she, I mean, she still thought she knew that he was crazy, but I think she also didn't realize she, there was no way of knowing how bad it, that I was going to, how bad it was going to be for me. Um, and I remember going to see him after I'd lost all that weight. And he said to me, oh my God, like, okay, you can lose, you can stop losing weight now. And I remember thinking, no, nope, no way. Like you just watch me now. Yeah. Kind of and, uh, and, and that was, that ended up, oh, it ended up being my life for decades was this fight 
with my body and it took over everything. I mean, I was this little girl who was like in shows and, and at camp and for my community would dance and sing. And like, I had so much confidence and I was very outspoken and just fearless and really felt like I could take over the world if I wanted to. And then I became this person who felt I didn't belong and wasn't worthy of anything. And I had just gone into a, a prestigious theater school and I dropped out um, and just felt like, what's, what's the point? Like it was, it was, it robs you of so much. I mean, I, the eating disorder started because I needed to feel a sense of control, but you really, you have no, no control once it, once it hits, it's just, it's, you're completely out of control. So how did you kind of wake up to it? And what were, like, what would you be eating too when you would eat? Yeah. I mean, I went through phases. I mean, there were times when, when I was young, like that age, and I had dropped out of school and I would stay up as long as I could at night so that I could be tired during the day so that I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't have to face kind of like the day and I wouldn't, and I, and I would eat, I remember the time I'd have coffee and like two apples and that would be like my day or I would weigh and oh my God, I would drive my sister crazy. I remember she walked in on me in the kitchen once and I had bought a tin of these like little mandarin oranges they can get in a tin kind of thing. And sometimes they have juices or syrup. And I was like rinsing each one individually to get off if there was like to any sugar. Off. Yeah. And she, oh she gosh. looked at me, she was, se she's seven years older than me. She looked at me, she's like, I can't, I can't. <laughs> and just walked at, like, it was ridiculous. And I would weigh and measure everything um, that I ate. But again, like it was, there was a time and I, I talk about this in my book actually when so my sister again there was one time she walked in on me in the bathroom after I'd gotten out of the shower and she screamed because my spine was sticking out of my back so much and um I met her at a mall one day and she said oh you look good and that was oh, it was like the it was like she'd slap me in the face because in my brain when it left her mouth she said you look good but by the time it got to my ears what I heard was okay, she usually doesn't think I look good because I'm too skinny, but now she's saying I look good. That must mean that I gain weight. And that's what I heard. And so immediately it was like, okay, what can I cut out? What can I cut out of my, of my food? And so there was one night when I was lying in bed and I hadn't eaten. And I remember feeling like my heart was stopping. And I, I kind of, you know, heard it, felt it, it was, to me, it felt like it was slowing down. And I felt, and I thought I'm going to die tonight. I'm going to die. And I thought, I was thinking about my mother who was in the next room. And I thought, oh, she just buried a child. Like, how could I do this to her? How, I should get up and go to the kitchen and eat something. And then I thought, but what if I'm not dying? And what if I eat something for nothing? And I couldn't, I couldn't do it. The fear of gaining weight was bigger than the fear of dying. And it's also important to say that while I did deal with anorexia nervosa, I also went the other way. And I, and there were years where I was binge eating at, like out of control. So when you say, how did I get out of it? Oh my God, it took decades. I mean, I, this started at 17. I went into recovery in my thirties. So it was, it, and I went, I mean, I was single. I with my eating disorder, got married with my eating disorder, had babies with my eating disorder. It's, uh, oh, it went through, and that was the thing too, for a long time, it was my, it was my crutch when bad things would happen in my life. And sadly, a lot of bad things happened in my life. I had a lot, a lot of trauma and it was my way of, okay, I'm good at, it was my way of coping, even though it wasn't helping me at all, but focusing on my body when the whole world was so scary, focusing on my body was something that it was a distraction. So, um, and, and, and it, I mean, it, it messes with you physically, it messes with you emotionally, it messes with you. I mean, it's just, it's so all encompassing. And, and there were times I would try to get help. I always tried to get help. I knew I wasn't in denial. I knew I had a problem. I hated it. Um, but it's very hard. Sometimes you're just, you're just not ready to get, like, you're not ready to do the work. I was too afraid of getting weight or it wasn't the right program. I'd seen different therapists. It wasn't right. 
Um, and it took me until, I mean, I, I was in a very bad way. Um, I had ki my kids were, I think they were toddlers, maybe, maybe a little bit older than that, probably a little bit older than that. And I, I was tired of every thought in my head was what I had eaten, what I was eating or what I was going to eat. I missed vacations. I missed friends' weddings. I missed out on so much life because I thought I wasn't pretty enough to go. I mean, it's, it's insanity. And I hated the fact that there were times when I would go out for dinner with my kids and they'd say, are you eating today, mommy, or just watching? Um, and, and, and I'm lucky that they were young enough to see more of me in recovery than without recovery and it didn't impact them. But it, I got to a point where I had given up on myself. Like I'd given up on my, it's exhausting. And I had given up, my life had been super hard, the whole body stuff. And I had been, and listen, the crazy, crazy thing is there have been a few times in my life where I was, there was one time back in 2000 when I was for something completely different. I ended up in the hospital for two months with kidney failure and respiratory failure. It was a weird reaction to an antibiotic. I was on, uh, um, I was intubated for 17 days. I was given a 25% chance of survival. I had major surgeries. I was not expected to live. And when I did survive that, I thought I am never going to worry about my body again, like weight wise. I mean, how crazy, like what, I, that's since I just, I had to learn how to walk again. I had to learn how to breathe again on my own. I'm not going to worry. And then <laughs> fast forward a year and I'm bodybuilding and dieting and not sleeping and going to the gym at two o'clock in the morning, belonging to two 24 hour gyms because one has the audacity to close on Christmas. It's insanity. I mean, taking diet pill. I mean, it's, it's, it, that's why when pe people don't understand how devious and dangerous eating disorders are. When people think you don't die from that. You die from other addictions. You do. You can. It's they're so serious, um, and they're what so. What does and recovery and, look like? Like, how do you recover? So it could look different to different for different people. For me, so again, to go back to what I was saying, um, I had given up on myself, but I had these two little boys that I felt deserved a mother. That was, I mean, I had. I had been lucky enough to have a, a, the most incredible mother. And I lost her when I was 28 and pregnant with my first. Um, and I, I thought, okay, you know, they deserve a mother who's even, if I could be half the mother that she was, they deserve that. And so I got healthy for them. I always say I gave them life, but they saved mine. And I went into, I actually called uh, a, a program at a hospital and there was a, a year waiting list. So I got on the waiting list. And then they called me and I'm like, you know what? No, I think I'm good. And I got off the waiting list. And then I was like, no, you know what? <laughs> I'm not so good. And I went back on. And I went to this recovery program. They wanted me. There were two. They had one that was outpatient. So you're there. I think it was like three times a week for a few hours. And then there was one that was, it wasn't inpatient, but it was m more um, concentrated. It was like, it was more extreme. So it was, I think every day and all day. And I'm like, that's the one they wanted me in. And I said, I can't, like, I, I need to, I am a mom. Like, and even the three day week one was tough for me because it meant that I wouldn't be there to pick them up after school on those three days. And that was torturous for me. Like I just, it was so important for me to be there for them, but I did that one. And I'll tell you the, the, I talk about this in my book too, because it was terrifying at first because they gave me this list of foods that I had to eat every day. At this point, I want to say I was overeating. I was not anorexic. I was binge eating, which is when people say, oh, I binged today. I had, it's, binging is eating an enormous amount of food in a very short period of time. But it was, I, it was not, I would eat until I was in pain, wait an hour and then keep eating like it was just there were times when my I was married at the time and I remember him saying to me one time he's like it is not humanly possible for you eaten that much in that short period of time like it's almost impressive the damage that I could do um so I was overeating at the time and yet they gave me this we all had the same list it was a group thing that I went to and it was foods that I had to eat every day and I looked at this list and it was there were columns it was like something from a something from b something from c 
And it was, you know, you weren't allowed anything diet, anything low sugar, anything low fat. It was, you know, in the column A would be stuff like yogurt and maybe cheese. I don't know. And then you got down to every day, it was a piece of cake or a sundae or a, like something that was terrifying. I cried. I was in my 30s and I looked at this and crying, like, how am I supposed to, what am I? And and they don't get, they tell you, like you get on board, they give you a couple of weeks, I think. And then if you're not on board, you're out because there's people literally dying to get into this program. And they expect you to mess up at first. And I did because I had to learn how to eat two cookies. I didn't know how to eat two cookies. I knew how to eat no cookies or two boxes of cookies. There was no in between for me, like for real. And so at first I tried every day to have, and then and it just didn't work. I would just eat too many. And then you kind of, then I kind of realized, oh, you know what, if I eat, because they're only, only the first ones are good anyway. By the time you're eating your 17th cookie, it's just, you're just, you don't even, it's just not, it's not good anymore. I would realize, oh, if I have this today, I can always have it tomorrow. And that was the thing with it, my eating disorder brain was I'd always, if I let, quote unquote, myself have something that I liked, that I felt was bad because society says it's bad then I would feel the need to repent. So I would either say, okay, I have a chocolate bar today, so I'm never having a chocolate bar again. Or I'd say, oh, I had the chocolate bar. I'm such a bad person. I might as well have a dozen chocolate bars. Like I didn't realize, no, you could have it today. <laughs> it's not going to do any damage. And if you want tomorrow, you can. And that was the biggest, and then it became, so I started doing that. Like I would, every day I'd have what they said because I wanted to get better. So like I want, and I was away from, didn't pick up my kids from school three times a week. If I was going to do that, I better, this better work. Like I better give this my all. I have to say, it didn't take long before. First of all, I, I ended up actually losing a little bit of weight because I wasn't doing the, the, the binge at the, once. The, yes, it wasn't do right. So my, and I learned like, oh my God, you can actually have whatever you want. Like it, it was moderation. I was having everything I want. And then it became exciting. Then it was fun. Then it was like, ooh, what? Oh, I haven't had pie in 30 years. I can have a piece of pie. Like, then it was fun, you know? And it was, and I really, it t- they took the fear out of food. And and that's what it was. It was just, it was all about food. And, and food's not the enemy. You know, we weaponize it, but it's not the enemy. And um, I was still exercising, but I wasn't allowed to exercise <laughs> at two in the morning. It was like normal times, you know, for an hour. And, and I was sleeping, yeah. so that helped. It's like amazing. It's like, what? You know, you're eating normally, you're sleeping. <laughs> Shocking. Um, and, it, that, and that completely changed everything. Completely changed everything. And so one of the things, like growing up, my mom, she was always on the diet that was in the magazine, like right. the toast diet or the... I was one of those Melba toast and cottage cheese, and I can't eat cottage cheese to this day. <laughs> That's so funny. But growing growing up too, it was like everything was fat free, but it was full of sugar, right? Mm-hmm. Every like these diet fads that they do a huge disservice because they're usually like, you know, that. They're not like whole foods. They don't have all the nutrition. So I can also see like if you do have an eating disorder and then you're trying to do fat free and then you're eating all that sugar and then you're gaining weight, it's kind of like setting you up for failure too, because you're if you just ate like some, you know, like some whole foods, like we you know what it was too. So it crazy. was first well, there were the two parts of it too were that A, it was never satisfying. So I would eat these chocolate flavored things. They weren't really yeah, chocolate, yeah. chocolate. And it's not the same. Yeah, they're brown. It's it not the like same. chocolate. So you're not satiated. So if you're craving chocolate, I would be do much better if I had a chocolate bar and they'd yeah. be like, that was really good. Enjoy it and go on with my day than to eat a hundred of these fat free chocolate like things that I'm not that aren't satisfying me. And then what would happen often too is I would, okay, so I really want, let's say, I really want a piece of cake, but I'm like, let me have a piece of cake. So I'm going to have, and then I would have the Melba toast because that was safer. Okay, but that's not, okay, so now I'm going to have rice cakes because I'm still not satisfied. Okay, so now I'm going to, and then you go, I would go through a million other things and then end up having the cake anyway. So instead of just having the cake, which would have done nothing bad to my body at all, instead I had 10 times <laughs> as much and it wasn't even good and by the time I ate the cake I couldn't enjoy it because I was so full 
from the other stuff that I ate. So and then you feel bad none about it. of it makes it you feel bad. So yeah. none of it, none of it. And you still, you feel bad and you blame the cake when it's not the cake, <laughs> not the cake. So that's, yeah, that's the, it's, it's such a, it messes with your mind so much. And the more you get into it, the more, like you don't, I would try to explain this because when I got out of the program, I started a workshop for kids at schools and, and I would be, there are so many parents who just didn't get it. My daughter, she's beautiful. I don't understand how she's, and I'd say you're looking at her through completely different eyes than she is. And and that's the thing. I, it's almost like carnival eyes, like those mirrors at carnivals that you look at it and you're either really stretched or you're really wide or we don't, we literally don't see ourselves the way other people see us. And so to say logically, like my mother would be like, oh, I don't get it. Like we don't, eh. because she's seeing me with healthy eyes, but I was seeing myself through completely unhealthy ones, distorted but, ones. And now that one of the things that scares me a lot is um, these filters that everybody's using because for me, like I put on the filter thing and I was like, like it was some kind of like, oh, the, like, what's your model face or something that yeah, 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 people yeah. were doing on the plane. And then I was like, no, oh, I'm pretty sure I actually look uglier with this filter, but yeah. also <laughs> like, this just doesn't look like me. So now we're going to put a standard to a, like little girls and stuff that this is what you're supposed to look like. And but that's been a wreck. But I'll tell you what's worse than that for me, because. Right, but that's been around. I mean, that's, we had photoshopping before where people read magazines, right? Where there's Photoshop, there's airbrushing. That's, that's, I remember I, part, of, part of the workshops I used to do called Fit versus Fiction is when I would go to schools, I would show them a whole bunch of like before and after pictures and airbrushed uh, actresses and, and actors that were airbrushed. And, and, and it's photoshopped and it's mind blowing and it would blow their minds. And I see filters that way. I think at least with filters, you sort of know, I mean, what the tough part is you put a filter on yourself and you think, oh, I like how I look when my face is smoother and I look taller and my, and so you want to try to get there in real life. That's a danger, but I think we know enough to know, oh, that they're using a filter. What makes me scared, what makes me, mm, what infuriates me is I was, I worked in the fitness industry for years and left many years ago because I find, I find that not everyone, there's some great fitness companies and instructors, but the fitness industry, I think, is very devious because they promote oftentimes the the they promote eating disorders under the guise of health. You know, don't take Monday off. Your body doesn't know it's Monday. You know, work work till your job. Oh, you the the it's that whole going back to like the 80s of no pain, no gain kind of thing. You know, you gotta work until you puke and um and and even with food, I mean, the thing is, even when you talk about whole foods, like, you know what, sometimes you can't, I mean, it's a financial thing. It's a, it's a, it's a cultural thing. We all eat differently. And I think that there's not everybody can have whatever bowls that you get from whole foods that you put with your yogurt. And oh, it's just not realistic, cool. you know, and it, and to see superfoods, superfoods are bullshit. Like, I'm sorry, there's no food yeah, there's no that's going to save you. And there's no bad food. Like, I really don't, I, I don't demonize any food. I'm sorry. Like, I don't even think having a Twinkie once in a while is going to do damage to your, it's not. If you are a healthy human being, if you, if all you eat is, is, junk food yes you're going to feel bad but you know what i knew somebody in recovery program who all she ate was broccoli that's not healthy that's either. Not, yeah. so it really comes down to what makes sense and i and i do think that that there are a lot of mixed messages with uh, in the fitness industry and the fact that a lot of fitness models and instructors still need to look a certain way and when they don't look a certain way then they're looked down on you know and and i uh, i mean i've had I've done, I did years ago and I post about it sometimes. Um, and, well, unfortunately it was for as a TV station that isn't fantastic, but um, I, I had written an article for Huffington Post sort of about overtraining and the, the, the obsession that we have with weight. And I went on and I mean, I was probably, I don't know, maybe five pounds heavier than I'm now. And I was very healthy, very fit. And a lot of the viewers didn't like what I had to say because I said fit bodies come in all different shapes and sizes. And, and people said I was promoting obesity and they were like, what does she know? She's overweight. She's too fat to talk about. And it's like, Oh my God, 
so we are just, we are programmed in such a way that we can't even imagine that a healthy body can be a different size. I remember there was, was it Nike? There was some, there was some fitness company that was putting out workout clothes that came in plus sizes and people were just livid. It's like, okay, well, so you Nike insult people. That. And it's like, well, how do those people ever get to be a fit size? But that's it. It's, it's like, <laughs> exactly. It's like, we're going to shame you for being overweight, but we're going to shame you for trying to, it's just, you can't, you can't win. So it's, it's in, to me, I've has had somebody ask me recently if I feel like, oh, but they said that it's gotten better, right? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I don't, I think it's, I think we're still, we're still so fat phobic in our society. Like we really, we really are. And it's, uh, it's upsetting for me. And, and social media does make it worse. It absolutely does, which is why I think for all ages, but I think it's so important because our feeds are, are often full of that stuff um the diet message i think it's so important that we i i know that even if, listen i'll have friends who post on social media about their diets or their workout routine and i just don't i love them but i won't i won't follow them because i don't want to see it i just don't want it and it's not that they're doing anything wrong i just don't want to my life was so about my body for so long i just ah, tell me I, it's just not interesting i don't want to hear about someone's diet i don't want to i don't care what it intermittent fasting, keto, vegan, ugh, well, I don't care. Like I just do it. Whatever works for you, do it. But I don't want to, I care about it. <laughs> and I don't talk about it. Like if somebody asks me, I've had people say to me, like, what do you eat now? Or what's your exercise routine? People know I dance because I dance every day, but I don't, I will never post a workout post. Uh, I'll never post what I eat. I, I, I don't want to do, A, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to compare themselves to me. Um, and it's just not, that was what my life was for so long. I think that what I eat and how I exercise is the least interesting thing about me. So I'm not going to share it. So you wrote a book that talks about the whole, your whole life, basically. So are you a stripper? I guess that's the question. Of the <laughs> right. Great. So, well, it's a bit deceiving. Um, it's, so the book is called The Good Stripper, A Soccer Mom's Memoir of Lies, Loss, and Lap Dances. And I did dance for a very, but it was a very brief part of my life. While I was dealing with my eating disorder, I was married, had two kids. Um, I was actually stripping to pay for my personal trainer to get me to look a certain, yes, because I, it was a very messed up time in my life. I'd been through a ton of trauma at that point. My marriage was not in a good place. And I met a trainer who said, I can get you look like a fitness model in like eight weeks. And, but I, obviously I'd have to pay him. And I was a stay at home mom and I was very hands-on and I thought, okay, I don't want to take money from the household because I felt, I felt guilty because I wasn't bringing money in. I didn't want to ask anyone for money. So I, I felt, okay, well, I need a job, but I don't want a job that's going to take me away from my kids. So I, so in my brain at the time, which was not healthy, it was what job can I get <laughs> that I can do while everyone else is sleeping? And my husband at the time and I had been going to strip bars. Our marriage had had taken a really bizarre turn at this point. And I thought, oh, well, if I dance, then I could put the kids to bed, be be home with them all day, be there to tuck them into bed at night, dance. And then I would come home. I was the only dancer who had a protein shake in her locker. I never had a sip of alcohol or a drug the whole time. Uh, I would I would come home, change, go to the 24-hour gym, work out, come home, take a shower and start and start the day without sleeping. And I would do that a, a couple of days in a row. Um, so I, but I only danced for a few months, um, but, but the dancing was part of a double life that I led for a few years where I, it, it really went back to how I felt when my brother died, which is I felt like, I felt like the the only thing that would make me worthy in the world was something to do with my body. So I allowed myself to be sexualized. It was me trying to find my my worth at this point. So my my father was out of the picture. My brother had died. My mother had died. I was estranged from my sister at that point. I didn't have extended family at all. Um, I was married, but we were in a really. I wasn't feeling very supported in my marriage at all. Um, and so it my two focuses were I'm going to be the best mother I can be so that my kids 
never feel unloved. And I will try to find validation through the sexualization of my body. And that's how that came in. And it was, that was, that fueled the eating disorder too, because if you, if you know if people are going to see you naked, you're not going to eat. <laughs> so, so that was that. I'm just thinking, like, probably do better if you're kind of fat. If you're a stripper, you got more jiggle. <laughs> I I know, I know. Probably, probably. But I, I mean, that makes sense. It makes a, you know, you got the, probably a confidence booster too. In a way, but it was just not how, like, and I and I say I I talk a lot about having shame in my past, and it's not with the dancing. I mean, I think. I don't look down at anyone who dances at all. Um, and I don't think anybody should. It it was, that's not where I carried my shame because I always loved dancing. I mean, I mean, listen, I say also though, I loved, I remember being um, being at the club and this woman came over to me and she, she was working there and she said, how long did it take you before you went on stage? And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, she goes, I've been here couple months and I'm like nervous to get up on stage like how long and I was like what do you mean like for me <laughs> I'm like five minutes like that was my favorite part was <laughs> was being on stage I hated having to approach people after I didn't even mind the one-on-one -on because -one, it's like it's you know you, you're a character and and I felt control it's the buy me you know rent me for three yeah. songs like I hated that part of it because that was not good for my like my self-worth like that was just an awful thing but the dancing part I I did I did love but it's again it was I wasn't sleeping I wasn't eating I mean it was yeah it wasn't it, it, it was not sustainable but I wish that I had stopped the double life with the dancing I wish like I had done that longer than where I was getting involved with it was just promiscuity and it was just really unhealthy and then uh took a few years and then I made obviously made some changes. I, I talked about in my book, something that happened that I kind of went, holy shit, I got to make some changes. And that's when I started getting healthy. That's when I went into the eating disorder program. And it helps a lot. Like I said earlier, when you're eating properly and you're sleeping, <laughs> it's it's amazing what, what thoughts, how the thoughts change in your head. And uh, and that was that. That was the, the start of the change. Yeah, it seems like being a flight attendant like I jump time zones a lot like I just got back I have to always think about it <laughs> but uh the day before yesterday and usually I would sleep all day the first day but I didn't get to sleep all day yesterday and um you know I'm jumping like I think like six or seven time zones each time I'm going to Europe so it's a lot on your body and people really don't realize like how important sleep is. <laughs> like I know. Yeah. They don't realize like, especially people who work like if you're working night jobs overnight, like your body doesn't um as you stay up like longer than you're supposed to be up, your body will start to um become resistant to like accepting the glucose into your cells and stuff like that and you're at higher risk for heart attack and stroke mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Uh, absolutely I think also even just your you need to reset and I know even to this day I know there, there'll be times when it'll be let's say I, I know after 10 o'clock whatever it is that I'm worried about stop it like don't even think about it because you're not going to be as worried about it in the morning like I know my brain does not work as well. And I'm somebody who, when I write, I usually write, like I, with my book, there were times I wrote, wrote right through the night. Like I do do stuff late at night like that. But when it comes to, oh, I'm panicking about something. I'm like, what time is it? It's 11. Nope. Table this till tomorrow. Because my, it just, and I've read somewhere that that's what happens past a certain time. Don't make big decisions. Don't let things get to you because you're just not, you're just not thinking it, you know, you're not using whatever all cylinders. And so, um, that's the thing. So if you never sleep, if, if when I was going a couple of days without sleeping and I'm never having that reset, then I'm never thinking clearly. And you're making decisions that aren't good. And it's just, and then you can't tell, you can't, you don't know that because you're, there's, you're, you're relying on yourself and it's not the best, not the most reliable source at the time. And always being hungry. Like, 
being hangry is a real thing. Like <laughs> I can't. Yeah, but then you get to a point that you don't even don't. like. It's just it's it's so beyond. Like it's I I'm trying to. There was a time when my trainer I'd love to have a conversation with now, um, but my trainer had me on. I was only allowed to have a quarter cup of water a day. That was the, yeah. And that went, I don't remember how long that was for because I was having pictures taken. And so they, you know, you needed to be like sucked in and all that stuff. And so it was summer, peak of summer. I was training a couple hours a day. And the only liquid I was allowed all day was a quarter cup of water. And I remember saying to him at one point, I was at a, um, like some sort of show with, at my kid's school. And I remember calling him and saying, okay, I felt like I was going to pass out the whole time. He goes, okay, good. It means you're doing it right. Was this um, uh, for, you? I think you mentioned you were doing bodybuilding? But I wasn't competing. Like, that was the thing. Like, I was just doing it because I was, as if I was competing. Do but body, I wasn't competing. Bodybuild, do they have uh, weight classes in bodybuilding or no? It was for, fit, like, the fitness. He was training me as, a, like, a kind of, like, a fitness model thing. Yeah. So it wasn't so big. You, I was Yeah, because when you're tiny. dehydrated. For people listening, when you're dehydrated, your muscles stick out more. <laughs> well, well, it was interesting because, yeah, so I was, oh, well, well, what he did at first was I was drinking gallons and gallons of water. And it, the idea was to trick my body and then, to, and, but it's for anyone listening, it's just, it's so horrific on your, my body. I didn't menstruate for a year. Like your whole body is off. It's just completely, I mean, I felt awful. And he was saying, well, good. It's not, it's never good. <laughs> it's never, and he would say to me, you know, if your friends or your family are worried, just, just, they're just jealous. Don't, don't listen to your friends your fa- or your doctor. Yeah. Don't listen. Like, I mean, you know, you're so, but just to show you how um, deceitful, let's say he was too. It's that I remember after, so we had some pictures taken and, uh, and then he had said to me, okay, so we had finished training together and he said, all right, um, can you do me a favor and bring in a picture of you? like before we started training together and then he was going to take one of the pictures that we had so he can show people at like before and after. Now the thing was, I was fit and yeah, very lean before good. I started working with him. Like I, I looked before he, to some, to a lot of people, I think that I looked better before I got so, so, so skinny. So I brought him in a picture and he's like, Oh, well, there's not, did you have, he said, do you have a picture from another time in your life when you were heavier? And me being the idiot I was at the time, I found a picture from like my honeymoon years earlier where not only was I heavier, but the wind was like blowing my shirt in a way where I looked so much bigger. And he used that. So that's what he would go on to show people. I took her from this to that, which was bullshit too. So it's just, that's the fitness industry. At least at that point, he's that person. Uh, It's no, know who you're, no, no, know your stuff. (laughs) Do you still do bodybuilding or you're just you know no but I work out every day but but I don't go to a gym I haven't as somebody who is obsessed with the gym I haven't been to a gym in years and years and years um I just have a bike and I have some free weights and I have some hills near my house that I'll walk up and down sometimes and I dance like I said every day I like feeling healthy I like feeling strong um I like feeling energized it feels good it always has and so I will do something every day. However, I say that, but then there are times where I'm like, nope, I'm not going to do it today. Or if I have to miss a workout, it's fine. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't change the way I eat. It doesn't make me feel bad. There are times when I know that that the workout, okay, I planned this workout, but you know what? My body's telling me it needs more to stretch than it does to. So I I I let my body tell me what it what it needs to do. And being listen, being active is great I think it's it's incredibly necessary but I think that there are people who also feel like if they can't do it a certain way if they can't go to a gym if they can't whatever run a treadmill for now then it's not it doesn't count but my thing is don't try to do something that isn't you like there's so many there are apps now that you can use that have all kinds of walking things and yoga and God, so many different things there's so many ways to be at play a sport like if, if exercising isn't your thing that's that's exercise so I, I am, I feel better when I'm active, but I'm not, you know, it's, it's, it's because it feels good. If it didn't feel good, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. I did, um, jujitsu for a long time, uh, when I was a kid and I, um, my father died when I was 14 mm. and that year, my, 
I realized that he was going to die and that I wasn't really going to have any money for college. <laughs> so I realized I, I'm really good at jujitsu. Wrestling is similar. Let me go out for the wrestling team. Oh, wow. And I was not welcome because I was a girl. <laughs> And their star wrestler would have been like the 115 weight class. And the, you know, the, per the I forgot what they called them. They were like the uh, physical trainer or something, you know, the person that's supposed to like keep track of everybody's weight or whatever. Um, I couldn't be in the star players weight class division. So I had to go. Oh, no. So they told me I was already like 125, but I, you know, they always subtract, usually you subtract like 20 pounds in fighting, which is totally unhealthy, but yeah. they wanted me go down to, um, 89 pounds. Oh my God. And I've been <laughs> the same size since I was in eighth grade. So like they wanted me to go down to 89 pounds. And uh, my thank God, my mom is a nurse practitioner that specializes in women's health, and she's like, "Uh, no, <laughs> you're not. You're not doing that." I tried to cut weight once for a jujitsu tournament because I was like right on the cusp of like, like uh, I probably only needed to lose like five pounds, which at that weight it wasn't like that big of a deal, but. I just remember she's like, all right, you're just going to eat like some salad. Like, cause all I ate back then was like coffee cakes and like <laughs> chocolate chip cookies. Mm -hmm. So I think it was because I was on such, I had such like a high sugar diet. I went like one day without eating sugar and eating like salad. And the next day I was like crawling out of bed trying to get a cookie because the sugar crash was so wow. And I was like, I would rather fight someone 10 pounds heavier than me than try to lose weight. Well, totally. And and I know a lot about that. Actually, one of my sons um, is a master in Taekwondo and he competed for years for, the, for his country all over the world. And I could tell you that our house was not a fun place during weight cut time. Like that was, I mean, th that was, and I hate it. It got to a point where I said, I won't do it. Like I made you, I'm not breaking it. Like it was, it, the weight cuts were horrific. And I mean, and I would see, I would see a tournament, there would be some kids little who were running around in those suits that are like, like garbage city. bags. And yeah, to, the garbage bags. I mean, Sweat off. I, I'm sorry, but that is not, there was one time, the first time my son had to lose a ton of weight and for a huge thing. And, but it was the same thing. We, we hired like a, a nutritionist or a dietitian or whatever. And I said to her, I will not do anything that will negatively impact his health. Like he is my child first. He's an athlete second. And she was like, thank God. Like, she's like, I, I hear from parents who do not think that way. Yeah, we exactly. were, we were on the same page and we spoke <laughs> several times a day and it was, and then when it was done, we were both like, Phew, like it was exhausting. But, but it did get to a point where I saw it was interesting because this kid is, a, he's so level-headed. And um, I saw that there were things that would happen with an athlete. He never had body image issues at all. He was super fit. But there were, there were things that he would do that were very eating disorder behavior. Yeah. That, and it was because, like, he would tell me he'd go to the grocery store and just walk through the aisles and look at food. I'm like, that's an eating disorder thing. Or I would... I don't think he'd be upset with me saying, but, but we laugh at it now, but there were times he'd be away in Europe competing and I go into his bedroom and I'd find under his bed, just boxes of cakes and cookies. He didn't touch them. And they'd be like moldy. He just liked to look at them. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, that is not okay. And thank God when he stopped, like it was, he was healthy after that. Cause there was no, there was nothing, but are you hear about so many athletes who do end up with eating disorders, lifelong eating disorders, because of what they did for the training. And yeah. one of the things I did just to say this for with my body image program, when I would go to schools is I would show pictures of, I picked like six bodybuilders and these guys, big guys. And I would show the kids and I'd say, what do you think they have in common with each other? And, uh, and they'd say a tanning. Yep. 
and you know big muscles yep and I'd say well they all won huge competitions like Mr. Universe Mr. America all that stuff and I said they all died really young and it was from the training that went into making them look so strong that it, they got a lot of them there was one there was one guy who had won Mr. Something and that night he died in his hotel room from cardiac arrest so it's, and, and I remember talking to teenagers about that in, in a high school and then being about a couple of weeks later, I'm at a food court in a mall with my kids and when they were little and three boys from the school, cause it was music came over to me and they go, you ruined fitness magazines for us. Like you, <laughs> you don't look at them the same way. And I'm like, good, good. That's, that's the whole point is that you see, I say all the time. The skinniest woman in the room isn't always the, the healthiest. And the guy with the biggest muscles isn't always the strongest. Yeah. It's way bigger than that. Yeah. I always thought like, you know, weight shouldn't just be the only factor when they're doing like these martial arts competitions. Like they should be testing like how hydrated are you? <laughs> like, you know, well, I mean, the problem I with just... those is that you have too many people who, who will starve themselves because and, and that's the crazy thing too is I would see for weigh-ins my son and his friends would get down to nothing and then one meal and they're up 14 pounds with a few like in, within a couple of that and it's just like that is not okay so yeah. it's not even fair like a lot of I spoke to I did an article about this actually and and, uh, and I spoke to a lot of athletes who like they don't want it they would love it if they could just compete they've got weighed in that morning not or right before not the day before or whatever yeah. and you could just fight at the weight that you're at because what happens is somebody will lose a ton of weight and they'll they'll fit into the the lower weight, the class. Lower weight class but by the time they fight they are they're way above way that up. so it's yeah. not even it's not even fair they're, yeah even i fair. used to the competitions i used to do were the same day weigh-ins so maybe you had like an hour maybe two at most before you fought but oh it, wow uh, so you didn't want to lose too much weight because you still had to be strong enough to fight but if right. they do like like a like UFC and stuff all those weigh-ins are the day before right and they do like a ceremonial weigh-in and then they have like the fight the next mm -hmm. day so like they have time to rehydrate kind of I mean they take it to the extreme so like they're still not going to be 100 percent. they're on death store when they're weighing in sometimes like sometimes they have to be yeah they have to be held on they have to be placed on the scale yeah. and then, i mean it's it's and that's and that's sports that's fitness that's that's those yeah. these are athletes like it's like come on no it's very frustrating and the fight would be better if they were healthier too. right if they were at their like, peak strength i know very frustrating See, the whole world isn't it's just messed up when it comes to our bodies really we will beat our bodies up so they can look a certain way instead of we fight against our bodies instead of working with them and and i will tell you i think it's so insane that our bodies do so much for us every single day to keep us alive i mean they really do everything we, they work so hard to keep us alive and we have the audacity to say i don't like you because i don't like how you look because this is too big because this is too jiggly it's like come on on i stopped doing that my body survived so much i'm super grateful that it still works the way it does you know yep <laughs> i don't agree more <laughs> oh so i'd love to to uh hear a little bit more about how you started your podcast and like what you're doing now? Uh, the podcast, well, the podcast came out of the book because when I when I wrote the book, which was me revealing decades worth of secrets that I had carried so much shame and so much fear against. And I felt like, I felt like I'd spent so much of my life not letting myself be healthy and happy because I felt I didn't deserve it because I had done such bad things during that time of my life. And I was terrified of the truth coming out. I was terrified that people would know I danced. I was terrified that people would know that I had been with people I shouldn't have been with. I was terrified that my kids would find out and they would hurt. The, and I was, I had so much fear. And then I was turning 50 and I was like, I'm done being afraid. Like I'm, I'm done being afraid. And if people are going to like, <sighs> I want to start living my life for, for me in the sense that um, I just left uh, a marriage that wasn't healthy. I'd left that a, a few years before. And I was like, I need to start being who I am. And that means forgiving myself for, 
for mistakes I made when I was just trying to survive. And that's actually how I dedicate my book is it's for anyone struggling to forgive themselves for, for the mistakes they made when they were just trying to survive. And uh, I, so I wrote the book and I didn't know how people were going to react. And everybody was, I really didn't get any bad. Re- I mean, there are some people who didn't love that I wrote it, but for the most part, um, people reached out to me, people I knew, people I didn't know who there's, there's something very liberating about, about rooting your own reputation in the sense that I took that risk, you know, before it came out, when I found out it was going to be published, it was like, am I ready to risk ruining my reputation by sharing all these things that people would never guess? And I was like, you know what I am and let the chips fall where they may. And it was the best thing I ever did. It was incredibly liberating. And I'm known now for being so insanely honest with my, about myself and how I think and, (laughs) and just everything. And, and I'm the one who like, you know, it's, it's, I'll say it, I'll do it. I'll, what I'm glad I'm not hurting anybody. Like, ah, like this is me, love me or not. I don't care. Um, like I really don't like as somebody who spent their whole life worrying about what other people thought. I really don't. Like I really, I, I don't care what people think. And it's great. And people like that though. And people feel comfortable being themselves with me. People feel safe being themselves with me because I'm, I'm myself. And so I realized that there are a lot of people who are living with shame or, or under stigma. And so the podcast came from that. So I, I speak to people who either have, could either just be that they have unusual jobs that people don't quite understand, or they're living lives that are criticized and stigmatized like sex workers, um, dominatrix um i i but i also we talk i i spoke with somebody who wrote a book about pronouns and non-binary i've spoken with three transgender men talking about their story things like that racism we've talked about um open marriages um infidelity uh you know things that that people uh aren't often comfortable talking about we talk about it and and what I find is there are people who will come into the podcast, who listen to the podcast, who then message me and say, okay, I was ready to judge, you know, and then they're like, but I really like them, or I didn't see it that way, or I didn't get that, or now I understand, or, or that actually sounds kind of interesting. Or, and, and that's the whole point is like, I really feel like, like a lot of our judgment comes from fear and fear comes from ignorance. So if you don't understand something, it scares you, you don't like it. But if you take the time to listen and to learn then the fear goes away and then there's less judgment and more understanding. And then it just makes everything so much better. Just makes us be so much kinder or allows us to be kinder to each other. So that's where that came from. I think I might have a good guess for you. (laughs) (laughs) Great. Uh, This is my friend, Sarah. She's a sex therapist. She's pretty, she's so interesting. Um, But yeah. So, uh, thank, thanks for thanks for coming on. Yeah, uh, thanks for the conversation. Absolutely, and uh, thanks for watching Chef Grace's Place, everyone. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>